Thank you very much to Shara. Thank you, Georgie. Um, thank you for this invitation to speak. Um, it's, it's funny, I have so much material on this issue. I actually found it quite hard to put together a kind of a brief overview and hopefully one which is easy to understand for people who don't have any background in, you know, Marxism or, or you know, the women's struggle or pol political life generally. I've, I've done my best to make it um, as broad and, and simple as possible. Uh, forgive me if at any point it isn't as uh, easy to understand as it ought to be. I have done my best. <laughs> um, I've also done my best to be brief, but it's for me, it's not that easy a topic to be very brief on. So um, I'll try and stick to half an hour. If I go slightly over, either forgive me or Georgie, if you think it's getting boring, just, um, just cut me off. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I just, uh, oh, and before I go, I would ask you, because I do find it a bit weird, this talking at a screen, and it's really lovely. I can see some of your faces, hooray. Um, but if at any point, you know, I say something that you like, if you could do one of those little reactions, it's not because I need approval. It's just so that I know that people are actually listening. You really are there. I find the whole Zoom talking slightly off-putting. It just helps me to know that there really is an audience and I'm not just sort of imagining it. Yay, thanks, Daniel. So, all right, I'll kick off. Uh, we call this um, meeting Understanding the Women's Question. And um, so I guess the first question is, what is the women's question? Um, and quite simply, when we talk about the women's question, we're talking about the fact that women uh, suffer and have suffered an extra level of oppression as compared with men ever since the dawn of civilization. Um, that was the time when people stopped living in primitive tribes and began to build complex societies. And um, even today, where conditions for women in many parts of the world have really improved a lot compared to what they were a century ago, um, it's still overwhelmingly the case that wages are generally lower for women than for men. And that might be because they're paid less for doing the same work, or it might be because they're concentrated in the lowest paid jobs. Um, it's also the case that women tend to carry out not only the lowest paid work, but also most of the unpaid work in society. So women carry out domestic labor for their families, um, whether or not they work outside the home as well. Um, women tend to be the ones who act as carers for their young, old, sick or disabled family members. Um, and women are often used, sadly still, um, as punch bags for the frustrations of their husbands and boyfriends. And we're hearing now again about a rise in um, domestic abuse with the lockdown, you know, all of the stress and the pressure cooker environment that's creating creates frustration. And it is still the case that uh, across the world, it is seen as a natural way to vent your frustration for many people to go from men to women and then down to children, you know. Um, and of course, there's also the aspect that it's still considered normal and kind of inevitable that there is a huge sex industry uh, that relies on selling the bodies of women who've been either physically or economically coerced into this form of sexual slavery. And that the men who choose to have really a kind of right to access these services. Um, so here in Britain, uh, women have been presented as inferior to men for more than 2,000 years. And that's the case, uh, it's been even longer the case in those parts of the world uh, where civilization developed earlier. And so throughout the period of class society, which are we, I'll use those terms interchangeably, civilization is the period of class society, class society is the period of civilization. Um, but throughout this whole period, uh, we were told that we were weaker, that we were weaker not just physically, but also mentally. You know, we were told that our brains were smaller and less powerful and just not up to thinking in the same kind of complex ways as men. And therefore, it was obvious that we weren't really fit for public life. Uh, we were told that we were kind of lifelong children um, who needed the guidance and control of people who knew better, i.e. the men in our lives. Um, a woman's place is in the home was the mantra 
of our ruling class until very, very recently. And even today, that's a message that's really quite commonly pushed uh, in our culture and in our media. Um, and for millennia, the law gave men the same dominion, control over their daughters and their wives as it gave them over their slaves and their serfs. The right to beat them, to lock them up, to dispose of, the, of them in marriage, or if they were difficult or seen as surplus, to put them into nunneries or even lunatic asylums. You know, these have all been ways of, you know, offloading <laughs> the women that you couldn't, you know, marry off. Um, and essentially, women's legal position until very recently was that they were chattels, the private property of property owning men. And our only recognized purposes in life were to carry out unpaid domestic labor um, and to produce children. So the question, I think, before you look at what the situation is today, you have to ask, how did that happen? Because the fact is, it wasn't always the case. Um, women were not always seen as inferior. It's not an inevitable result of being a woman that you're seen as inferior, because for the entire period of history before class society, which is the majority of human history, that wasn't the case. And you'll still find today uh, where there are vestiges of primitive communism, you know, tribal societies still existing, that isn't the case. So because of women's importance as child bearers, early human societies saw women as being at least equal and often as more important than men. Um, there was in those primitive societies a natural division of labor um, based around the physical abilities and the physical requirements of uh, the different sexes. So on the one hand, women were collectively responsible for running a household, gathering food, they cared for children, they cooked, they made clothes and baskets, gathered wild foods. And when that technology developed, they did the beginnings of planting and tending of very small scale crops, which is the very early beginnings of agriculture. Um, and on the other hand, men tended to be responsible collectively for the heavier work. So they went hunting, they tended to livestock once domestication had started, they built shelters and they made tools. So, but these divisions didn't imply that someone was superior and someone was inferior because all this work was recognized as being socially necessary. The tribe survives because all these things are done and therefore all the work is needed. It's carried out collectively for the benefit. So women, whether they were working in the households or gathering food, they weren't isolated. They worked together um, and looking after the children wasn't seen as the kind of sole responsibility of whichever woman bore that child. It was, it was done as a collective endeavor. Um, and often, you know, older women would be looking after children while younger ones went off to gather food and all the rest of it. Um, this really changed when technology developed to the point that societies started to produce a surplus. Um, because once a society can produce more than it can consume, once one person's labor can feed more than one person, then it becomes possible to start to accumulate property and it becomes possible to exploit another human being. There's not much point, you know, making a slave out of someone whose work will only be enough to feed themselves. There's only a point of doing it when they can feed you as well. So, the end of this era of primitive communism was the beginning of the era of civilization. It was the beginning of the great division of society into exploiters and exploited. Um, and the first great division into classes was the division into slaveholders and slaves. Um, and it was women's misfortune and really an accident of history to find that when this development occurred, the first property that was being accumulated happened, just happened to be in the hands of men. Um, it was in the form of livestock. Um, and as herds grew, uh, they became the first riches of humanity. Um, and some men began to amass personal wealth and they became very powerful in society. They became dominant in society, in societies that previously had not had hierarchies, a hierarchy started to emerge. And these property owners wanted to be able to pass on their property to their children. But in the old division 
a society, um, the society had been split up into family groups. And those family groups were based around their relationship via the female line. They were matriarchal societies. Your relations were all decided according to who you were, who you were related to through your mother. And so any inheritance that went on, and there wasn't much to inherit and pass on, but you know, if a man had some tools or a woman had you know, some, I don't know, baskets or jewelry or whatever, if they had something they wanted to pass on, the way that you did it was to relations via the female line through your mother. So a man, if he had something he wanted to pass on, he could pass it to his brother or his sister or his sister's children, but not to his own children because they are born into a different kinship group than him. And so this idea of paternity wasn't recognized in a legal sense, a legalistic sense. Um, so even after you know, pairing marriages developed and one man and one woman became normal, there was still not a social requirement for women to be kind of 100% faithful, for their children to 100% definitely be the husband's children, and um, no requirement that couples kind of must stay together if they don't want to, that sort of thing. It was still a kind of loose, fairly loose bond within a wider social grouping. Um, so when this new requirement for being able to pass your property to your children arose, these matriarchal structures were dismantled and patriarchal ones were built instead. Um, because of course, the requirement became, how, how do you guarantee that the paternity of children? There is only a one way, essentially, and that is lock up the women of the property owning classes so that they have no contact with any other man apart from their husband. It's not possible for them to be unfaithful. It's the only, it's the only way you're going to guarantee that. Um, so in fact, that is what, that is what was done. Um, locking up women of the property owning classes and turning them into what essentially was senior slaves in the households of their fathers and their husbands. Um, and of course, you know, once that becomes the culture and the norm for the ruling class, that's then disseminated across the whole of society through the ruling classes, ideology, its media, its culture. And so a whole moral, moral justification was developed and a system of violence to justify the subordination of women um, and that was that spread through the whole of society and um, women became commodified uh, you know they could be bought and sold essentially into, into marriage and their work was downgraded in several ways so working class women uh, ruling class women sorry in particular were seen as chattels for the production of heirs that's the main thing that your main job when you're married to somebody is to produce heirs um, as long as their purity could be guaranteed and also if their class connections were desirable to their prospective partners. Uh, and in that case, they could fetch a high price um, and they could be used to cement kind of profitable alliances between families, between rich families. Um, and of course, in that situation, in the new class society, domestic labor stopped being something collective and communal um, and became a private service for the male head of the household. So, and alongside this, uh, you have this development of the idea of absolute monogamy. So total fidelity in marriage um, becomes society's official moral code. Um, but in fact, what we see right from the beginning is that this total fidelity was really only required of women. So the hypocrisy uh, was born then, which is still alive and well today actually, that alongside enforced monogamy for women, there arose this brand new industry of prostitution, uh, whereby a section of the female population was coerced in one way or another into providing sexual services for those men who could afford to pay for them. So the official code of all class societies is monogamy, but the reality is what they mean is monogamy for women and look the other way when it comes to men. Um, and as a result of all these developments, women were degraded from being full and equal members of a communistic society to being subordinate members of a class society. Um, now, I've tried to give a kind of brief overview of this. I can't go into it in a, at great length. I hope 
the information is enough to give you just a, a, a basic outline of the roots of women's status as second class citizens during this whole era of class society. Um, and I'm not sort of giving this to you as a kind of dry historical lesson, but because it's really important to understand why women have been oppressed for so long, where all these really strong prejudices we have about women come from, about their capabilities and their role in society and all the rest of it. Um, and it's this historical insight that enables socialists to recognize that the women's question is a class question and not a gender question. Because women weren't oppressed because they're naturally inferior or because men are naturally nasty and violent. They were oppressed because of the way that class society developed historically. And it's understanding the root of that problem which enables us to find the key, uh, the solution to solving it. Um, now you'll hear a lot of people say that, um, well, you know, everything's changed now. You can't really say, talk about, <laughs> thanks Rajit. You can't really talk about women's oppression now. Everything has changed. Um, and we're used to hearing that the battle for equal rights has been won. And as proof of this, we're shown that there's a woman can be a scientist or a doctor or a newsreader or a politician or even a prime minister. Um, but the fact remains that in Britain today, working class women in particular still suffer an extra burden of exploitation over and above what is the norm for the men of their class. Women are still in the main working for less money or in the lowest paid jobs and are still carrying out the overwhelming majority of society's unpaid domestic and caring work. And of course, the capitalist class has got a vested interest in making sure that situation continues because if women didn't do all of this cleaning, cooking, laundry and caring for free, it would have to be provided as a paid for service. It's all necessary work, right? It has to happen for society to run. You can't do without it. So if women weren't doing it for nothing, someone would have to be paying for it to be done. And of course, paying for those services to exist would eat up profits and provide no particular benefit to the capitalist class. Um, especially since capitalism anyway is unable to provide useful work for everybody. You know, why would they want to um, free up all these women to take part in productive life when already they can't employ everybody who's in the workplace? Um, so this is why the capitalists work so hard to maintain gender stereotypes. And of course, there is one other reason, uh, which is simply that the capitalist system is, the, is, involves the rule of an tiny, tiny, tiny minority uh, over the vast majority. And the only way such a tiny handful of people can keep their grip on power, apart from creating a whole machinery to do it, is to make sure that working people are divided against one another and see each other as the problem. And so they have a big incentive to keep men and women feeling that each other is the problem and particularly to persuade women that men are the problem when it comes to their freedom. Uh, they have no interest in seeing men and women united together against them. So we have to understand that when we're looking at this question. Um, that's why the capitalists work so hard to maintain gender stereotypes, even while they're busy telling us that we've won all our freedoms and don't need to feel constrained by anything. Um, and in fact, it's been noticeable to me, um, particularly because you know, my daughter is 12, um, that in the last 10 years, along with many other attacks on the working class and the speed up in dismantling the welfare state, the pushing of gender roles has actually gone up again. It was receding during my lifetime, it's going back up again. Um, it's noticeable that social expectations and morality are still very different for women than for men, whether it's around how many sexual partners someone might have had, or who should or shouldn't take care of children, who is allowed or not allowed to have strong opinions, uh, who should pay the most attention to their appearance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the plethora of, you know, pink for a girl, blue for a boy, clothes and toys. Obviously, you know, they're money spinners for the manufacturers. There is that. But they also carry a really strong social message. And it's harder and harder to get away from. I've got to say, as a mother of a young daughter, 
you know, I found that if I want to give my daughter clothes which don't have any message of, you know, because of course you can avoid pink, but pretty much it's by buying something that's covered in trucks that says kind of boy all over it. You know, there's, there's very little involved in the in clothing that's available to working class parents for their kids, which doesn't have a gender message on it. If you want gender free clothes, you have to spend quite a lot of money. You have to make a big effort to find it and you have to spend a lot of money on it. The stuff that's available in the supermarkets, you go and have a look next time you're down there. If it's not something you've thought about or looked at recently, just have a look at the racks of the clothing that's on sale. Um, it's totally encoded with gender messaging. Um, and alongside this sort of implicit messaging, our children are explicitly taught from a very young age that certain behaviours are associated with certain genders. And we're very much encouraged, obviously, to conform to that. So boys are expected and encouraged to be strong, to handle themselves physically, to suppress their emotions, right? Boys don't cry, and to prepare themselves for a life out in the world, um, toughen up. And girls are expected and encouraged to be quiet, to avoid playing roughly, you know, you don't wanna mess up your clothes, to be pretty and decorative, to think about and work on their physical appearance, to make people like them, to be sensitive to the motivations and needs of others, um, all really in preparation for a role catering for the needs of others at the center of a family home. So these ideas of what your place is and how you prepare for it are still being pushed very strongly, even though we're told that that's all a thing of the past. And of course, alongside this, we've got the growth of the sex trade, which has been fueled in the recent uh, decades by the enslavement of huge numbers of women from states of Eastern Europe, which, has bas which have basically been recolonized. They've become colonies inside the EU. Um, huge numbers of their women have been sold into sexual slavery. Um, and there's also been alongside that, the development of a huge pornography industry. And all of that has a massive impact on our popular culture and reinforces these ideas that sex generally and women in particular are things you know, to be bought and sold. Um, and of course, you know, there's a kind of fundamental experience that most of us will have that women in capitalist society suffer a very heavy economic and social penalty when they have children. So formerly there were communities that would take collective responsibility for raising and caring for our children, but these have all been broken down and, and capitalism as it advances break, breaks them down ever further so that we are all now in, living in very, very small isolated units. And child rearing now is presented to us as being a purely private matter, just the personal responsibility of one, or maybe if you're lucky, two parents. And those parents may or may not have the resources to give their kids good food, decent housing, educational opportunities, cultural and sporting activities. Um, they may or may not have time to give their kids the personal attention and input they need to grow up balanced and healthy. But whatever they can or can't do, is presented to us that this is their problem, not society's problem, their individual problem. Um, and there's basically no recognition officially of the fact that bringing up the next generation is a socially necessary, useful thing to do. You know, women, are, women with new babies are pretty much left to sink or swim, often left very socially isolated just when they need the most support. And again, in recent years, we've seen uh, privatization of social spaces. So for a little while with the welfare state, we had things like community centers and maternity support and health visitors. And, you know, all these things are gradually disappearing, but community centers in particular have all but disappeared. And what that means is if you're a working class mother with a new baby, you are really stuck at home on your own with a new baby because there's nowhere to go to meet other mothers and share that load and take the kids to a play space. Everything costs money. So either you can put your kids in childcare, that costs you money, um, or you can meet other mothers in a cafe. Now, I used to live in an area of North London where everyone would go on how wonderful it was, all the cafes and how baby friendly they'd all become. But of course, what they didn't pay any attention to was 
there's a price ticket to get in there with your baby. You've got to buy coffee and cake. And never mind the fact that coffee and cake is not necessarily what you should be consuming all day every day or feeding your kids all day every day. Um, you, have to, you have to pay for it, right? When you went to the community centre, you could just turn up and stick the, stick the kettle on. That has gone. And we have had a privatisation of our public spaces, which has been pretty much disregarded uh, by the capitalist media um, and has left working class women and children really high and dry. So having children is presented to us like it's a lifestyle choice, not a biological imperative, not a human need. I mean, nobody talks about the fact that society isn't going to last very long if there isn't a new generation. You know, I can choose, I can make a choice not to have children, but I really hope some other people are having children so that when I get old, there are still people to do all the things that I need to be done, right? To take the bins out and, you know, weed my garden and, you know, come and wipe my bum when I can't do that anymore. You know, somebody's kids is going to have to do all of that work. And it might not be my kids, but it will be somebody's. So having children clearly is a requirement for society to exist. Um, but it's presented to us by capitalist society as if it's a lifestyle choice. And it very much pushes in the media this attitude of, well, if you can't look after them, you shouldn't have had them. You know, it's irresponsible of people to have children they can't pay for. It's not society's problem, it's, it's your problem. Um, and many mothers aren't able to return to work after they've had children because the finances and logistics of childcare just don't work out. Um, and in this way, they become isolated and cut out from social and productive life. Um, and if you do manage to go back to work, um, you'll very often find that you're discriminated against in various ways um, because, of course, you've lost that desired level of fl flexibility that employers want. You know, you've got other priorities, how shocking. Um, you might need to work part time. You might need to, you might not be able to turn up early for a meeting one day because you're dropping the kids at school. You have to leave on time every day because you've got to collect your kids from childcare. You just can't drop everything the way your employer thinks you should be at his beck and call all the time, 24 seven. Um, they pay lip service to your rights, but they want you flexible. And what that means is there when I want you there. Um, and when you have kids, you're not able to be so flexible, right? And employers don't like it. Individual employers feel that employing such women is unprofitable. It reduces their efficiency. And the women themselves find it much harder to be promoted or considered for, you know, anything interesting uh, at work. They're usually expected just to be grateful that they've still got a job because they're, they're a bit of a pain in the ass. You're a bit expensive and a bit annoying and we have to work around you and isn't that, not, isn't that rubbish? be grateful that we still you just like you're a charity case um, and you know that's in the better paid areas of employment in really low paid work of course uh, women have to find family members to help them with childcare. Um, if they don't have them they just don't go back to work because they can't afford to pay for the child care the child care costs more than the wages that they're going to earn um, and in those types of jobs they're heavily penalized for needing to take time off to look after sick children to attend school events or do anything else, you know, that interferes with their ability to turn up on their shift. Um, and it's interesting to note that since the last economic crash uh, back in 2008, there has been, again, a kind of strong ideological pushback on the idea of, of working mothers um, in all areas of, of life, in, including in the better paid sectors. Um, you know, we're constantly told how wonderful it is that women have made advances in these areas, but actually it's being pushed back against by employers for the reasons that I've just enunciated because, and because, you know, profits are under, under threat, you know, it's starting to be seen as a bit of a pain in the ass that women have won these rights. And people are openly, um, you know, kind of uh, pushing against those rights, pushing for those rights to, to be rescinded. You know, there was a surgeon who wrote, back in 2014, I think it was, a, an eminent surgeon wrote in the Daily Mail uh, complaining about the expense of training and employing women doctors. And he basically said that it's a waste of public money because they're going to go and have kids and take maternity leave. And, you know, what's the point? What's the point in wasting, wasting people's money on training these, these women up? Um, and a uh, similar sort of time, there was a politician, I can't remember his name, I'm sorry, who said that um, women can climb as high as they like in the city. Um, you know, he's talking about this whole glass ceiling business, um, provided they're prepared, prepared to give up on having children, which is a lifestyle choice, right? Don't make the lifestyle choice. 
my nephew. So I'm not going to go massively into the whole glass ceiling and gender pay gap thing here because um, they're very much the focus of the privileged sections of, of working women who, who push what I would describe as bourgeois feminism. Feminism. I'm just going to call it feminism here. Um, the ideology of, you know, equal rights for women under capitalism. Um, clearly, it would be better if we lived in a society where, you know, even the highest paid women were paid equally with the highest paid men. But equally clearly, that wouldn't actually change anything for the mass of men and women workers who were struggling to survive on unlivable minimum wages and universal credit. Um, so how do feminists approach the women's question? Um, it's interesting because, you know, I've talked already about how our society talks a lot. We're talked to a lot about our rights, our right to choose. We're allowed to choose where and how we live. We're allowed to choose what we do for a living. We've got the right to choose who we marry. We can choose whether or not to have children. We can choose to follow our dreams. We've all got all these rights and choices. But if you judge a society not by its words, but by its deeds, you get a very different picture. Because um, in all this discussion about our theoretical freedoms and rights and choices, um, there is no mention made of the way that all these choices are actually in practice defined by the conditions that you live in. Because the fact is that in capitalist society, many of these apparent choices are either very limited or entirely non-existent. Because what choice does a child have about what kind of housing or education he's provided with if he's born into a poor family? What choice does a woman have about whether or not to have a child if she has no money and no family and no community support? What choice does a worker have about where to live or how to eat if he has no job and no money? What choice does a sixth former have about career paths if she's got no ability to pay for her training? You know, we're told that we're free to choose and we're blamed if our choices don't lead us to happiness and fulfillment and success. Um, but actually all this talk about choice is just a cover for the workings of the capitalist system which forces the mass of the people, both here in Britain and around the world, to live in conditions that they certainly would not have chosen. It's an attempt to really hide the fact that the wealth of the few rests on the impoverishment of the many. It's an attempt to hide the fact that it's the system itself that's making it impossible to grant equal rights for all. I mean, what use is the legal right to train as a doctor to a woman who's born in a slum, has never had an education and is trying to support a family on one or two dollars a day. You know, you can tell her she's got the right to train as a doctor, but clearly isn't true, is it? <laughs> so nobody's stopping her and yet nobody's helping her. You know, there's no physical law saying she can't do it, but the, the law doesn't actually describe people's conditions, the reality of their lives. And yet it's the work of people like that woman that's creating the wealth of the billionaires. If there were no poor laborers, there would be no mountains of capital for the captains of industry to be investing. So the representatives of this system refuse to recognize that there are social relationships underpinning the creation of our rulers' wealth. You know, their, rich, their riches rest on our poverty. It goes hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. So they're pushing instead the idea that the poor are poor through their own personal failings and bad life choices, rather than through the workings of the system as a whole. And there are plenty of left liberals who will see and even sort of criticize the excesses and the obscenities of this system, but they interpret the problems not as systemic failings, but as unfairness. And they think that this unfairness is gonna be fixed if we can just level the playing field. And so they put all their attention on this. How do we level the playing field? And essentially it's because they can't imagine anything other than the present economic setup. Set up. They can't imagine a world beyond the world of capitalism and capitalist production relations. And it stops them from seeing what for a lot of poor workers is blindingly obvious, which is that the capitalist system isn't capable of treating everybody equally. It, it 
fundamentally isn't. And so the idea that you spend your life asking an unequal system to treat people equally um, is clearly mental. But the limitations of people's viewpoint keeps them going along this fruitless avenue of activity. Um, you know, in the, the women's movement for equality in Britain really started to take off uh, back in the late 1960s and it followed a big strike uh, or it, or it came, came up really as a result of a big strike for equal pay that was carried out by women workers at the Ford factory in Dagenham. Um, and this movement really, you know, sort of lit a, it was a spark that lit a fire that spread across the whole country. It was something that was waiting to blow up and it swept up many women around the country. Um, and into this movement, the feminists put forward the idea that the basic reason for inequality was men are nasty. Um, and so the solutions that they put forward um, were along the lines that women should either kind of refuse to cooperate because it's a man's world and it's not built for you, so we've got to have a separate women's world somewhere, um, or that the way to get equality would be to learn to be like men. Um, and another version of this was telling women that in their role as the kind of domestic workers for the family, doing the cooking, the cleaning and the caring, they were being exploited by their husbands and that therefore they should seek liberation by demanding wages for housework. Um, and the feminists basically ignored the class antagonisms and replaced it with a domestic one. So we got the battle of the sexes. And instead of struggling alongside working class men to change society, uh, the feminists wanted women to blame all men, irrespective of their class, which of course leaves the whole system of production and exploitation intact and creates a demand that women should just have their fair share of top jobs running the capitalist state and running the big corporations. And then, you know, um, you know, all kinds of solutions came from this way of thinking, including refusing to have children, uh, which obviously there's, that city dude would have been very, very happy with. Uh, that's in order to be able to compete in a man's world and liberate yourself from the tyranny of the family. It's the family that's keeping you down. Uh, bra burning, because you're rejecting the symbols of your oppression. Uh, sleeping around, you know, because you can act like a man and then you'll be equal, right? Uh, becoming a lesbian was, was, you know, political lesbianism was, was put across as a kick the enemy out of your bed was an actual slogan in the 1960s and 70s of some of these um, bourgeois feminists. So it's not surprising that most of these ideas found very little sympathy amongst the less privileged mass of working class women. You know, the main concerns for these poorer women are around the daily issues they faced, the additional burdens that are on them from the, their responsibility for household chores and family caring, um, the low pay rates for women's work outside the home, and at that time, you know, their legal and social second class status. And their interest in politics had been sparked by a desire to be treated as equals in society and to have their excessive burdens lightened. But most of them really lost interest in the political struggle when the feminists um, came to dominate that movement. Um, and those feminists, they were adamantly opposed to all attempts to bring class consciousness into the movement. Um, but they went on to make very nice careers for themselves as academics and experts on women's affairs. They nearly all ended up in the universities. Um, people like Germaine Greer um, turned poorer working class women away from politics with their kind of insistence on finding liberation through liberation, in quotes, through sexual freedom and constant denouncing of men. Um, they were promoted in the media and allowed to take over the narrative in universities to the point where there's now several generations who've grown up thinking that, you remember this t-shirt, this is what a feminist looks like, means this is what the women's struggle looks like, you know? They believe that the, the, the kind of things that people like Jermaine Greer come out with are the women's struggle. That's what it's all about, hating men um, and all of the identity politics type of stuff that, that these people come out with. Um, and, you know, 
it's true that the fight for equal rights under capitalism essentially means fighting for the right of a few of the better off women to be allowed to do jobs that were previously reserved for men. Um, you know, according to feminism, ignorant and sexist, atti sexist attitudes are the problems of individuals uh, rather than something that's been deliberately created in our minds by a um, minority ruling class and its state. Um, and these attitudes then are presented to us as being either kind of intrinsic to men, like they're born like that, and so it's incurable, or something that you can cure, but just by a slow process of individual re-education and exposure, which basically means going one by one to every man who ever says or does anything sexist and lecturing him until he changes his mind. Um, and there's lots of left-wing kind of activists who really put up barriers between individuals by asking them to prove how worthy they are. You know, according to their kind of individualist philosophy, a man can't be a true fighter for women's liberation because he hasn't personally experienced the pain of being oppressed as a woman. Um, although, you know, he's allowed to be an ally if he wears a feminist t-shirt and says how guilty he feels for being in the patriarchy. You know, this emphasis on personal experience and personal pain kind of manipulates the natural feelings of empathy amongst followers of feminism and it sets them off down these kind of ridiculous and pointless avenues of like navel gazing i must understand my experience as a woman or kind of oppression hierarchy building i don't know if you come across this uh, kind of nonsensical activity where people sit around trying to work out who's the most oppressed you know and simultaneously it cuts the women's movement off from its most most important and most numerous allies, which is working class men. So the end result of, you know, bourgeois feminism is firstly the sabotage of a movement that had the potential to become really vibrant and bring large numbers of working class women into the struggle for socialism, you know, and they were turned off and sent home again. Um, it's resulted in the kind of self-defeating rejection of scientific socialism of marxism on the basis that uh, the main marxist texts were all written by men and therefore therefore must be irrelevant to women uh, you know now socialism scientific socialism is the culmination of humanity's knowledge and to cut ourselves off from it because you know the the people who discovered the truths that it contains were men is insane um, but that is that is one of the things that the feminist movement has has done and continues to do to say what has Karl Marx got to say to me what has Lenin got to say to me these are white men from a long time ago uh, don't listen to them don't be interested don't engage with that um, when in fact this knowledge has been dearly bought by humanity and is desperately needed by all the women and men who are struggling for a better world um, we've had a huge propagation of all of the feminist fake solutions to the women's question in the media and a burying of the understanding that the women's question is really a class question. Um, and we've had the creation of a field of women's studies, women's studies in academia, that spent years just brainwashing university students with a kind of false consciousness and created a kind of identity-led women versus men discourse. Uh, which is actually very unquestioned by most of what calls itself the left. Um, and there's been a wide acceptance of this kind of laughable idea that we can rely on the state machinery. Remember, this is a state which is controlled by the class that depends on oppressed women to, to perform unpaid labour and which has a vested interest in keeping the mass of working women out of political and social life. But we are told that we can depend on this state machine to implement equality through passing laws and policing us and doing kind of gender pay gap reports and all the rest of it. Um, and we've seen as a result of feminism, the feminist movement, uh, we've seen a huge and widening rift between the privileged university educated working women whose minds have been really infected with this feminist academic discourse um, and who kind of look down on poorer women who don't think that way and the poorer, less educated mass of the working class who really despise uh, the nonsense of such tropes as men are our enemies 
um, and have been brought by the media to believe that that is what progressive politics are uh, as regards uh, women's issues. So I'm sorry I'm going on a bit. I hope if we wave if it's all all right for everybody still. If you've gone to sleep, let me know. <laughs> still there. Um, so lastly, I want to come to the, uh, the question of how socialists approach the women's question. You know, it's, um, it's perfectly right to oppose discrimination on the grounds of race, sex, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, or anything else, because discrimination creates divisions in the working class and prevents us from uniting against our common enemy, but it's totally counterproductive to elevate your opposition to one particular type of discrimination into a one point program that trumps everything else and ends up actually exacerbating the divisions between workers. Uh, there was an author on the website I was looking at recently that a little sentence he wrote that I really liked. He said, if we're not asking and answering the question, how can we take power? We're wasting our own and other people's time and energy. You know, socialists promote the understanding that women perform a social role when they undertake childbearing, when they do the caring and household duties, that society wouldn't last very long if those tasks weren't being performed. In primitive societies, when that work was undertaken collectively in communal homes, this was obvious. You could see that the work was socially necessary. When we moved to a class-based society, the social nature of women's work was hidden because the women were working behind closed doors for their husbands and fathers. Under socialism, that work will once again be recognized and performed as a social labor, only this time, of course, on the basis of modern technique and equipment. So that's why socialists put the emphasis uh, for liberating women on public provision of services alongside equality before the, before the law and equality of access to education and jobs so that all women can be liberated, not only those from the more privileged classes. And of course, such services, by removing the private burden of cooking, cleaning and caring from working class women, will enable them to play a full role in social and productive and political life. And of course, they'll also mean that every child has the same access to decent housing, decent healthcare, and decent educational and developmental chances in life, no matter what their parents' time constraints or financial position might be. You know, socialism recognizes the class basis of women's oppression. It reveals the historical and property-based roots of that oppression. And that lets us understand why the machinery for enforcing it exists and how it operates. And socialism makes clear the reasons why the capitalists are constantly fostering and reinforcing sexist attitudes towards women amongst workers. And, you know, it fosters those attitudes amongst workers of both sexes, right? Um, so they can be persuaded to accept and reinforce the ruling class's repressive, exploitative, divide and rule agenda. You know, socialism doesn't require workers to prove how oppressed they are. It opens its doors to anyone and everyone who has understood that capitalism has passed its sell by date and wants to fight to abolish it. Because in the struggle, the socialist struggle for women's equality, men have as much to gain as women because the socialist society that both are working for will put all of our lives on a new, more dignified and truly equal footing. You know, we socialists are opposed to the political correctness police because political correctness is a way of substituting the policing of language for the real struggles against racism and women's oppression. Because when political correctness comes into play, it's un-PC workers who are hounded as the enemy. They're substituted for the real enemy, which is the system of capitalist imperialism, which creates those injustices and which can't do without them. You know, I spoke at the beginning about how our society promotes the idea of individual rights and choices. You know, socialists also believe in human rights. We recognize that man is first and foremost a collective, a social animal. Nothing in society is achieved by individuals. We're all of us reliant on one another and all of us are actually happiest when we're working together to achieve a common aim. 
not only does humankind need social contact and a sense of community to stay sane and healthy, but in fact, these huge means of production that we've created demand social action on a massive scale. So socialism puts the needs of the collective above the needs or desires of any single individual, but in doing so, it actually creates the conditions in which all individuals, and not just a privileged few, are truly able to flourish and express themselves, supported and valued by a real and not just imaginary community. Real rights, not just formal rights, will only be achieved for individuals under socialism. Thank you, comrades. Hello, that was absolutely brilliant, Jyoti. Thank you so much. You've opened up my eyes so much. Um, I'm looking about, I can see a lot of hands up at the moment, but I think they're clapping rather than asking questions. So if you'd all like to um, raise your hand to ask a question, then I'll pass them on to Jyoti, or pass you on to Jyoti. Have we got anybody there? I think Helen might have her hand up. Oh yes, Helen's got her hand up. Helen, you're unmuted, go ahead. Thanks, Georgie. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Jyoti, I thought that was an absolutely wonderful speech. It, it's opened my eyes as well. Georgie, like you say, because um, I've never heard anybody talk about the difference between the bourgeois um, feminist movement, etc., and and you know what it is today. It's still about today, obviously. In fact, it gets worse rather than better. Now that you've spoken about it, I can see it clearly. The difference between that and actual struggles for for women uh, among the working classes and and um the day-to-day -day grind mm. uh, and the, the stuff that gets brushed under the carpet um whilst oh well it's hidden by what you know the the germane greer stuff and, and all that and the pay the gender pay gap stuff and all that it it it's you know it's it's working against the women's struggle is all that stuff it's like a substitute. Well, you said the word yourself, substitute. I was just wondering if there was. I, I wish I'd recorded that. I wish I had it on on a uh, recorded that speech, or or if there's anywhere that you you have said it before, I'd I'd like to listen to it again <laughs> or similar. You know, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Did you want to comment on that, Jyoti, or? Well, just to say, I oh, thank you. I'm really glad if um, that information has, you know, been useful for you. Uh, I think we are hoping to uh, release a video of this meeting. We're not, um, we are recording at this moment, but so that people don't feel constrained to speak, um, we're not live streaming it. So we'll put the video up afterwards and anybody who doesn't want to be included in that video, they can just let us know and, and we'll chop you out. So please don't feel like because we're recording, you mustn't speak because uh, we don't want that to be the case. But uh, hopefully, if people feel this is worth putting up again uh, for others to see, we will we will release it as a video. That's brilliant. Thank you. I think, Rita, did you have your hand up? Rita? Yeah. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah, hi. Yeah. Hi. Well, I could see myself in some of the description of Jodi about women repressed by parents, father and husbands. Um, that was my personal experience actually, it was really bad because I was just in the house all the time growing the children and my work was never valued, even though I was working 24-7, never been, there was no holiday, and no sick pay, you know, even when I was ill in the night time I had to get up looking after the children. And my ex-husband would never do anything. Like He would never eat the sandwich. He want me to prepare a meal for him. So, here you go. <laughs> I can't believe it. It was like, uh, it's terrible. But mm. there can be a change. It must be a change, you know. It's between, we have to make a change. The women have to make a change. We cannot accept that anymore. 
we need just to, we need to move we need to move on to find a way to you know equality i'm not a feminist i never seen the why the feminists were just shouting all the time we have a different roles but the feminists come across to like we are you know we are like a man no we are not we, we can make children men cannot make children so we have a different structure body structure mental structural emotional structure and we are different but we need to be respected as equal both said yeah anyway thank you for you know if it's recorded i would be really happy and i'm going to share on my social media your video georgie yeah. oh, by the way, my cat is a female as well come on <laughs> <laughs> Fem lovely. Females make the best pets. <laughs> Got um, another two. Sorry, Jody. Did you want to speak first? Well, just quickly, I just wanted to come back with what Rita said because I think you really put your finger on it there, Rita. That the whole thing is that we need to be um, respected as equals, but not expected to be the same. Um, yeah. Because of course we have a different biology. We have different biological imperatives, not just we have children, but we have a monthly cycle that affects how our body works. And you know, we're expected to act as if none of that exists. Um, yeah. Actually, it brings many strengths with it, which could be harnessed by society, but because our society has been set up in a very male-oriented way, um, women's particular strengths are ignored. We are, we are, equality is presented as pretend you're a man. Mm. rather than accepting that we have different strengths and weaknesses and different things that we bring, but they're all equally valuable. And also yeah. recognizing that, you know, even despite biological differences and roles, there's pretty much nothing that women and men can't both do. You know, men can look after children and enjoy it and get a lot out of it. You know, women can fly space rockets or design space rockets or manage big corporations and get a lot out of it. But, you know, they have to be accepted as human beings, you know, yeah. men or women. And the, and the point really is to understand that while socialism has a vested interest in doing that, capitalism has a vested interest in not doing it. Mm. Right then, that was great. I've got at least four hands up. I've got Jay, then Germany, Christina, then Kat. So I'll start with you, Jay, if that's okay. I'm just going to unmute you. At least I hope I'm unmuting you. That should be you unmuted. No. There. Oh. Yes. You're, yeah. you're free to go. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Speak, speak. Hi, I'm Mike. So um, I'm Janita, I'm uh, one of the members of the Women Empowerment Sri Lanka group. So um, it was, uh, thank you for a, a, a great speech. Thank you, Jyoti. And it was a question sort of like, we, we're such a new group and we're just, uh, it's probably a couple of months since we start to form. Um, it's uh, more of a tips and things you can help us with, maybe. Um, we are struggling to get engagement from working class women, um, you know, as members, steering committee members, and also to sort of like um, participate in certain projects that we are doing. Do you have it? Uh, do you have any sort of tips and things that you can give us, sort of how to how to approach them? Because we are kind of struggling. Uh, to do so at the moment. Uh, if it's all right with you, I'm going to let that go around the group for a while before I come back in on it, because I think lots of people might have other things to say on it, um, and I'll and I'll come back to it in a little bit. Sure. Okay. Should we go to you? I hope I'm saying your name right, Jamini. Yeah. Hi. You're free to Please. speak. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Comrade Jyoti, thank you for your sharing this your knowledge and uh, thoughts and uh, uh, the, explain the real uh, class matter and one's question. Uh, but though uh, I need, I like to ask some uh, question. The origin of the uh, this is, this problem is, is, uh, is some people used to say uh, uh, or discovery of uh, flow discovery floor, uh, which is the agricultural uh, equipment, so uh, which make more productive than the... Is that true? So, it was um, the combination of um, the development of agriculture with the development of herding, domestication 
and of, of animals and, and creation of herds, which laid the basis for uh, the move into class society. But it was the fact that the herds, which were the first kind of mobile wealth, were in the hands of men, that meant that they came to dominate that new class society. So yeah, it was, it was the development of, of agriculture and herding, which enabled a surplus to be created and which therefore laid the basis for a class society. Excellent. Do you want me to ask Christina to speak? Please do. Just find you, sorry, I've lost you. I had you a minute ago. I've only got one eye that works. There you are. How could I miss you, Christina? Hello, comrades and sisters and brothers. What an amazing meeting. I salute you all. It's the hardest thing to find women to engage women in politics because we are so burdened, more burdened than ever before, despite the wealth that they think the West has achieved, despite our high education, because society doesn't provide for women who have children, who study, who work, who have to prepare meals, who have to keep everyone happy, who have to take care of older people. We see it now under the lockdown how much we need we have to do we are teaching children we are cooking we are taking care of all parents who might be living elsewhere and we have to visit them it's relentless it didn't have to be like that and it used it didn't used to be like that under socialist societies existing and in the past like the soviet union or if you go to see what's happening in cuba in china there are much more humane conditions for all workers, including women. In the Soviet Union, they had crashes, crashes where the children were educated to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. The mother would go to work and they would be taken care of. And when the mother would finish her early day, lively, refreshed and wanting to see her child, a child that was becoming increasingly a part of community, a part of society, not dependent, not clingy, she would be happy to take care of her child. We are talking about something that was achieved and we lost. Now, how difficult it is to, to, to find child care? How difficult it is to find and pay for child minor? You have to weigh. Is it worth uh, getting a job that pays just enough for me to have a child minder? How many careers are sacrificed in this? So it is not a choice. They keep telling us we have more choice. They keep telling us we are emancipated. We are not. It's not a real choice when a woman is not supporting in keeping a child, in raising a child, in educating a child and working at the same time. The only thing that gives us a true emancipation is our relationship to the means of production. If a woman does not have access to means of production, meaning it doesn't, she doesn't create work, she doesn't have work, she doesn't create wealth, she is not finding her place in society. She will always be inferior. So as long as we make the, the reason of our fight identity or pay or just, you know, freedoms and choices, we leave the elephant of the room out of the question, which is class. Class is what distinguishes people in positions and makes them exploitable or makes them exploiters or it gives them emancipation. It's money, it's work, and how society treats people according to class. So if we are true feminists, true feminism can only be proletarian. It can only be about how we include women equally in accessing the means of production, how we socialize the means of production, how we socialize child minding and crashes, how we provide for the children and we protect children. We are now living in a society where children and women are not protected. I mean, in the worst, in the worst way that you can think, and I'm thinking, I'm going straight away to identity politics and how identity politics is putting the ch children under such danger, right? Where their childhood is not recognized. The same as womanhood nowadays is not being recognized, right? And you have a lot of bourgeois feminists who will, who will actually go for it and will support the right of a man to self-identify as a woman. That erases womanhood, thus erases protection of children. So we have really, we have regressed in our struggle 
And we need to go back to remember who are the feminists who are never taught in universities? Who are the feminists, my children, my daughters, we never hear about, parents that are taught about Coco Chanel, who uh, made her career collaborating with Nazis, or Hillary Clinton, yeah, who is our sister, and we, show, we should all be very proud of Hillary Clinton and how she kills people, because she's a woman, because she has a womb. No, womb doesn't make the sisters. She's my class enemy. You are my sisters. <laughs> who are the early feminists that are never taught? I'm going to talk about two names, Alexandra Kolontai and Clara Tsetkin. These were two Bolsheviks, Bolsheviks, comrades feminists, who understood that class equality is what should be achieved. And patriarchy will disappear when capitalism disappears. Because the, the basis of the exploitation will go. This has to be why we fight. Whatever skin color we have, whatever we, gender we have, this is our goal. The, for me, the moment of like clarity that I had, like Helen described so vividly, was when I read this book. We should all read, I think. This book managed to take a veil over my eyes, a veil of 20 years of studying and teaching so-called bourgeois feminism in academia. I was teaching it. And this book, edited by a great feminism, feminist, Ella Rull, Marxism and the emancipation Marxism of women. and the emancipation yeah. of women is what will take the veil off our eyes so we can see the reality. Who are our sisters? Who are working for, for capitalism? Who, who, what is the ideology that turns us against men? So we can never, we will always be fragmented. We will never be as a class together, so we will never fight. And really, I salute you all. Um, this situation where we are is the great eye opener to realize who are your sisters. My yeah. sisters are not, my sisters and my class sisters and my comrades are not worrying about the holidays. Yes, or the sun tan. <laughs> yes, they're worrying about how they're going to feed their children, how they're going to survive on low income and low and, you know, support that was promised that this uh, that amounts to, to nothing. These, these, are, these are the words of my comrades and of my sisters. So it's very easy to see who is a sister based on class and who will fight next to you for your rights and who is just cajoling the system, wants to get from the system and to internalize even more the trauma of capitalism that makes men exploitative towards the women because this is how they are treated by their boss and we tend to treat our inferior like we are treated by the superior. So this is why capitalism, this is why you have always had marriages like this, based not on love but based on exploitation because this is what we teach our children, this is what we see in society. So when this goes, then things will change and we see examples in the past in other societies where they, where socialism was achieved, early socialism and also socialist directions that some societies are taking where women are treated differently. And you can see, you can see the respect, you can see the lack of objectification. That was Thank you brilliant. very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Christina. It's very hard to follow that. I've got three more questions. Do you want those first? Yeah, so what we're going to go with Kat first. I'll just unmute you. I keep saying that and then I'm not. There you are. Oh, hello, hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Oh, yeah, well, fantastic, Christina, and a, a fantastic covering, um, Jyoti, of the whole subject in itself. Um, I haven't got very much to add after Christina <laughs> just gave such a, such a good overview. Um, I suppose a, a couple of things that I would add to this is one, uh, Another reading recommendation, that being uh, to follow on from what um, I think it was Lucy who mentioned it right at the start of the meeting, um, not anti during by Engels, but Origins of the Family by Engels is a very, very good um, overview of how society has developed and is a, is a thoroughly, highly recommended um, read that you should all take a look into. Um, 
that would be one thing that I was going to say. Um, and the other thing, uh, is the, the importance of trying to get women involved in the movement. And I think one of the key things is making, like we we're talking about how society, it makes it, um, social society makes women's involvement in production and society possible by sharing and socialising um, all the burdens that we face. We need as a movement to think about doing those sorts of things too, making it accessible for women by inviting them along. Like I've got making sure it's accessible for, for children to come to, making sure that there are there's support to mean that when uh, women when women come into the into into meetings they're able to actually take part um, as much as they possibly can. And it's very refreshing to see so many men who've come along to this meeting as well, not seeing it as a separate thing to for women to only be caring about, but actually men to be involved with too. Sorry, I was going to say more, but I think Christina's done a very fantastic job with that anyway. Thanks very much. That was brilliant, Kat. We've also got, I think, Fushara, did you want to talk? You've lowered your hand. There you are, you're on mute. Oh, I've done it again to you. <laughs> I need to get mouse control. Please work. No, it doesn't want to work. Why can't I unmute you? Okay, ah, I'm gosh, you. sorry about that, everyone. Hello. Um, yeah, Joshi, uh, thank you so much. That was that was really um, enlightening in terms of, I was particularly um, found the history of the whole thing really interesting in terms of where all this stuff originated from. Um, and also the differences between the different types of te te feminists um, and true feminism, bourgeois feminism. Thank you. I, I had my hand raised, but I think Christine answered a lot of it and everyone seemed to have answered it because I was going to ask for books um, and book recommendations. And so I've got a couple of those. Um, so that's all really. Thank you very much. It's really helpful. Thanks ever so much. Uh, we're now going to go to Nadia, who I'm going to try and successfully unmute. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, You're not going to get me to do this. Oh, I can hear you. Oh, good. Yes, go, go for it. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Can Joe to hear me as well? Yeah. Right. Um, right. About the feminist issue, the the current in the current climate with feminism, what I've noticed it's a bit, it's a bit like uh, the neoliberalism. It's forced in your face, and it dances around all the subjects that irritate women. But it's not the problem. It's not the things that we we're, we're really concerned about. It's not the issues that we really face. In, uh, in everyday society. Um, my personal issues, uh, when, when, uh, before I was pregnant, going to work in the corporate environment, in the office, I had to watch out for 10 days of the month because I have PCOS, I have PMDD. And none of the, because I worked in a construction company and it was <laughs> majority men, but no one could understand that. But even before, when I was working with women, it, there wasn't any um, sympathy or forgiveness for that because they just didn't understand. If I was nervous or if I, if, you know, if I, if I said something out of turn, they'd say, oh, there's something wrong with her, or they'd just, you know, avoid me. So these things, you know, we're dealing with these issues as well. We have to, we have to adapt, we have to change. I mean, you know, and then there's the other side. There's, Things I see on TV um, since I moved back from uh, from Holland to here, I see Love Island. I said, "What the hell is this?" Um, blimey, uh, you know, it makes us look stupid, and I feel really cheap as a woman when I watch that. And then you think, "God, Emily and Pankhurst, look where our efforts went down the toilet." <laughs> and it's just, it's yeah, it's a shame. It really is a shame. And these things just have to change. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find a woman who's strong, serious, and has got the right heart in the right place as a, as a, you know, as an example, you know, I'm, I'm carrying a child now. If I have a girl, I want her to have a good role model. I've only got to look at the past and see Emily and Pankers, but at the moment I'm, I'm finding it hard. Anyway, thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Anybody else? I can't see any more hands up at the moment, and I'm not sure how we are for time, Jyoti, but... We're all right. Should I come back on a few of the things that have been said? Yes. Um, 
Just on that last point, um, Nadia, you said you look back in the past and you see Emmeline Pankhurst as a, as a strong role model. Um, you might be interested to look a bit deeper into the history of the Pankhurst family, because in fact, Emmeline Pankhurst was a proponent of bourgeois feminism. Uh, very much it was about votes for propertied women um, and never mind the working class men or women. Um, her daughter, on the other hand, Sylvia Pankhurst, she had two daughters and one of them was the same as her. The other one, Sylvia Pankhurst, became a socialist, was one of the founders of the communist movement in this country. Um, she w went to work amongst the working class women of the East End, set up a paper for them, uh, helped them to be mobilised for the struggle for socialism, showed them how the the women's struggle was the socialist struggle, essentially, as far as the workers are concerned, um, and uh, is a very interesting person to look into. She, there's a book about her, I think it's called The Home Front. You should look for that. I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, Alexandra Kollontai is another one who's worth looking into, um, historical uh, women's figures. Uh, she was mentioned already by Christina. Christina um, mentioned the emancipation, uh, Marxism and the emancipation of women, the book that was published by um, the Communist Party. And the reason that she has drawn this to your attention is because it documents the struggle of socialists in the women's movement during the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and it's, as Christina says, it goes blow by blow through all the arguments and the counter arguments and all of the strategies used by the feminists to try to um, divert the women's movement away from socialism. And of course, they, they actually were successful. Um, but to be able to understand what were the arguments for and against and how they operated uh, is very enlightening in terms of understanding what feminism really represents. And a few people here have said it, you know, that feminism really actually runs counter to the movement for women's emancipation, the real movement for women's emancipation, which of course is the socialist movement. Um, and thank you, Kat, for mentioning um, Engels's book, The Origin of the Family. Um, it's very unlike me not to start a talk on this subject by talking about that book. So I'm gonna just mention it a little bit more now. Um, anybody who wants to really understand the women's question, and of course you're gonna have to get over the terrible fact that it was written by a white man, but um, you have to read the book by Friedrich Engels called The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. That tells you where did women's oppression come from? Where did class society come from? Um, historically, how did they develop? And also historically, where are they going? And it's the wonderful gift of Marxism. And, and Friedrich Engels was Marx's closest comrade and best friend, and they were the co-founders of scientific socialism. Between them, they worked out the, the economics, the politics, the history. They revolutionized these fields. They revolutionized the field of history. It's a, it's a terrible shame for us that we live in a world where what they brought to the field of history is not taught or known, because once you start to appreciate history in the way that they explained it, they showed us how history actually moves. It's not moved by this king and that king and this individual and that individual. It's moved by classes, it's moved by the development of production, productive forces, it's moved by the development of technology and how we create the things that we use. Um, then history, your understanding of our history, which is our story, it's interesting and fascinating to all of us. History, it's, it's all of our story, how we got here, obviously relevant and important to every one of us, becomes a completely different thing. I was lucky enough to be given a copy of that book uh, when I was a teenager. I got it for Christmas when I was 15 or so. And um, I'm sure I didn't understand everything was in it, but I loved it. And I think I particularly loved it because I am a woman and because it does explain to you how come it is that the world is like it is when you're a woman? Um, and it also gives you a framework for making sense of the entirety of human history. And it also gives you the understanding to see how we're developing towards socialism and what socialism is gonna deliver for women. Um, it's a really, really 
wonderful book. Um, everybody, everybody in the world should read it, but certainly everybody who's interested in fighting for a better world should read it. Uh, you'll get a huge amount out of it. Um, I, it was really nice what Kat said about um, approaching working class women, and I'm hoping that some others of you will come up with um, your thoughts on how we do a better job of that. We have to understand that in Britain, because of the twin effects of bourgeois feminism, which put so many women off the idea of politics, and the massive kind of pushing of gender stereotypes which tell women it's not their business to be engaged in political life and to have opinions. Having opinions puts you open to the kind of criticism that women feel they just can't, shouldn't, shouldn't be exposing themselves to. You know, it's unfeminine to have opinions and to debate, to be involved in the social political life of society. That's simply what's pushed on us. And you very often find very intelligent, articulate women taking a back seat to boyfriends or husbands who are not nearly as, you know, uh, clear sighted as they are, but they, you know, men are encouraged to push themselves forward in our society, where women are encouraged to hold themselves back. And that's before you get to the question of all of the burdens that we have that stop us from doing anything, you know, because we've got to go from work to the kids or, you know, whatever it is, you know, got the cooking and the cleaning to do and all the rest of it. So um, making, making our movement attractive and accessible to women is definitely a part of it. Another part of it is just the fact that life has got to push women to the point where they realize they have to engage with the struggle. What's been really interesting is to see that that tide is, has been turning, has been turning since the 2008 financial crash and everything that that has meant for um, the lives of the working class in this country. It's noticeable that the first movement that really benefited from the fact that more women are looking for answers was the Corbyn project. And I know there's women here who came to politics by following Jeremy Corbyn, joining the Labour Party when he became the leader and feeling like, finally, here's something that can deliver something for me. Um, and it's been a very difficult uh, experience, I think, for a lot of people to find that that didn't work out in the way that they hoped that it would. But we, I hope, we can benefit from the fact that a, a whole tranche of women have started to become politically active, politically motivated, starting to find their feet and their voice. What they need, of course, is an education in socialist politics. Um, and, you know, hopefully people here are going to be part of helping to deliver that to them and making it feel like it's something accessible, something that they can get involved with. Um, but, you know, there is no possibility whatsoever of building socialism, of creating a movement that's capable of getting rid of capitalism without the participation of huge numbers of working class women. So it's definitely a very important task for us to be recruiting as many working class women as we possibly can into this movement. Sounds brilliant. Josie, have we got time for another question? I think Thushar would like to speak. Yeah. I'm always having trouble with your button. <laughs> Has it worked? I can't unmute you. It's working. You're free to go. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, Josie. That was, that was really interesting. I was interested in the books that you're talking about and wondered what you thought of Rosa Luxemburg as someone to, um, to read um, in terms of um, her contributions. Okay, are there any more? Any more from anyone I else? I can't say any more for any more. Let me just go on the next page. Uh, no. No, no. Uh, no. Rosa Luxemburg um, played a very positive role in the German movement uh, back in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, she played a very strong role in opposing uh, World War I, which huge number of socialists had before the war said they would oppose but when it came to it they voted for the war credits they sided with their own ruling class and they acted they 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 um you know they beat the drums for war basically and that includes actually uh, coming back to um what nadia was talking about uh, the pankhursts the pankhursts put aside not sylvia but her mother and her sister 
put aside their struggle for women's rights when the First World War broke out and um, turned themselves into recruiting sergeants for the war, went around giving out white feathers to people who wouldn't fight and all the rest of it. I mean, you know, they really sided with the ruling class in that endeavour. Sylvia was the one who refused to do that. Um, another reason why you should look into her. Um, so, uh, who are we talking about just then? Rosa Luxemburg, yeah, she played a very um, important role during that period, a very principled role, um, and has been uh, justly kind of elevated as a, as a female figure because of that. Um, unfortunately, at the very end of her life, um, because of course she was, she was done to death um, young and became a martyr, um, but before she, she was executed, she uh, unfortunately uh, denounced uh, some of the developments in uh, Soviet Russia. It was the very early days of the Russian Revolution and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lack of clarity about what was happening there. Um, I don't know if she uh, might have changed her mind later on if she'd have seen how things were developing she was a bit overwhelmed by the gossip that came and said oh they're kind of drowning everything in blood and isn't it terrible and i think she kind of had a response to that um she denounced the kind of the excesses of bolshevism and said oh no this is not the way to do things um probably based on not very good information to be honest but then she was executed she wasn't around then to see how the soviet union developed but because she said these things against the revolution she has been um, deified by the Trotskyists, who find it very useful that that's what she said at the end. So I just want to put that kind of balance of a picture out. There's a reason why certain people hold her up as an absolute hero. You must, everything she said was perfect, because of course it, it fits with their agenda. Um, my personal feeling is that very likely uh, Rosa Luxemburg would have changed her mind if she'd have lived a bit longer and seen everything that happened later. Um, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> she might not. Thanks for explaining that one, because I wondered about her too. I'd heard of her and didn't know much about her, so that's good. I can't see any more hands up at the moment. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please do. I think we've still got a few minutes. Still a bit. Any more contributions? Any more thoughts about how we get more working women involved? That's definitely a thing. I don't know, Helen, Lucy, any of you got thoughts about that? Ah, Kat. I just unmuted you. Go ahead. Hello, I've got another, I've got another thought on how you get more women along. And it's oh, to put a, bit of, put, put a bit of pressure on the men <laughs> to make sure, you know, it's not just about us being able to come out, but ask all the men who are already involved in the movement to make sure that they are encouraging and bringing along the females in their life, whether it's their sisters, their wives, their um, cousins, their work colleagues, to encourage them that they should be getting involved too. Um, that's really the main one. Sorry, that's enough, that's enough on that. That's a good one. Christina's also got something to say. Very briefly, you know how in past centuries, the first weapon in our emancipation is, was education, right? And, and right now, education is a weapon for us, again, the right kind of education, not the education that blinds us as to how to achieve our emancipation. But education is sharing the scientific tools that explain how we find ourselves in this situation and how to get out of it. It's, it's a scientific analysis. Like we studied, we went to the university, but today you can go to university, you can reach a PhD level, you can become a lecturer and still be blinded as to what constitutes your exploitation. So our education lies in exactly what we do today. And I want to congratulate my Sri Lankan sisters for this initiative, because it's exactly that education that is going to get us out of the situation where we are. And this is how we're going to be talking to our daughters. And this is what our daughters are going to be seeing us do. Every time we have a meeting, try to have a crash so we can bring our daughters, so we, we can socialize this experience of motherhood with other women. That young daughters listen to other women talk about class. 
and to talk about class, we cannot talk about class if we don't have the language. And the language has been developed scientifically by Marx, by Engels. And there are women, then we have a range of women like we, we talked about, Kolontai, Tsetkin, the, the women, the wonderful women like Jyoti, who is a living proletarian Marxist, and all of you are developing proletarian feminists, and we have to write, we have to produce new material based on class analysis that describes our experiences today. Like this in Marxism and the Emancipation of Women that was written many years ago, women of that time were able to use the tools like researchers to describe why they're being exploited. We need to do the same, and this is the first step, this kind of talk, this kind of education, it's the means of the production of knowledge that are going to get us out of the shackles of capitalism and oppression. I'm just seeing if anyone else has got their hands up, Jyoti. Not at the minute. That was beautiful, Christina. Well, Georgina, then I have a small suggestion and maybe people can sort of wave and show if they're up for that or not. We can either just end the meeting, say, well done, thank you, everybody. Or there's a very small extract from a book by Anna Louise Strong, uh, where she describes uh, the struggle in the Soviet Union against the veil, you know, so certain parts of the Soviet Union where women were still um, basically wearing a kind of full burqa veil, whatever, uh, and their attempts to liberate themselves from that and how they went about it in a socialist way, um, I thought might be a nice way to end the meeting. I could just, basically, I'll just read it to you because it's really interesting and uh, kind of makes you think about the difference between how socialists go about liberating women and, uh, you know, how the capitalists oh. forcibly do it. <laughs> you be up for that? Two seconds. Did you want to ask a question, um, Ranji? I can't unmute him. I think he did. Sorry. There you go. That right? Just to say, yeah. brilliant meeting, fantastic listening to JT and to all of you and all of your contributions. Thank you so much for organising it, everyone. Um, I just thought on the on the on how you can get working women more involved in realising this is for them. I think part of it is to formulate campaigns and demands which are focused around the interests of working class women. So if we want to get, I mean, childcare is such an issue, I think, for all of us. There's no so social childcare. Uh, care of the elderly and you know care, you know decent care in the community all of these tasks which disproportionately fall upon women if we demand that those should be provided socially at reasonable rates by the state for working women i think that is a campaign around which working women will realize this is a party actually which is about me and my interests because people don't call for free child care they, they, there's been um just articles in london and a similar thing nationally, but in London it costs something like £400,000, £350,000 to raise a child from birth to the age of 18. And a lot of that is childcare. You know, preschool, nursery is like basically paying the fees of a private school. So as you were talking about, you sacrifice your career because you can't possibly afford that for two or three kids. And who gives up their job? It's the lowest earner. It makes economic sense. Who's the lowest earner? Well, disproportionately at the time, it's going to be the women. So all of those things, if you have social child socialized childcare particularly at a time when there's mass unemployment and a depression coming when what is always the response of capitalism during depression is to say well with the workforce is shrinking so they once again emphasize that traditional role of women as a carer kids they suddenly will discover aren't normal if they're not brought up with a full-time woman in the house then, then they get in this wartime, all the men go off to war and they suddenly discover that socialized care is a thing and all the women have to go to work factories producing munitions. So if they tailor that message to what they need from the workforce, they can't give that now. It's gonna be a mass demand for working people to be a, a crushing us. I think that might be a campaign that we actually build as a workers party perhaps and, and a wider group. If we build that campaign, it might be a way to draw working class women to you. But otherwise, I totally agree with everything what you said and I'd love to hear that passage, Jyoti. I'll mute myself. Over to you, Jyoti. Thank you. All right, guys. So I'm just going to leave you with this. Um, I think a really beautiful and inspiring extract um, from the book by Anna Louise Strong. Um, and she says, the change in women's status was one of the most important social changes in all parts of the USSR. The revolution gave women legal and political equality, 
industrialization provided the economic base in equal pay. But in every village, women still had to fight the habits of centuries. News came of one village in Siberia, for instance, where after the collective farms gave women their independent incomes, the wives called a strike against wife beating and smashed that time-honored custom in a week. The men all jeered at the first woman we elected to our village Soviet, a village president told me, but at the next election, we elected six women, and now it is we who laugh. I met 20 of these women presidents of villages in 1928 on a train in Siberia, bound for Women's Congress in Moscow. For most, it was their first trip by train, and only one had ever been out of Siberia. They had been invited to Moscow to advise the government on the demands of women, their counties elected them to go. The toughest fight of all for women's freedom was in Central Asia. Here, women were chattels, sold in early marriage and never thereafter seen in public without the hideous paranja, a long black veil of woven horsehair which covered the entire face, hindering breathing and vision. Tradition gave husbands the right to kill wives for unveiling. The mullahs, the Muslim priests, supported this by religion. Russian women brought the first message of freedom. They set up child welfare clinics where native women unveiled in each other's presence. Here, the rights of women and the evils of the veil were discussed. The Communist Party brought pressure on its members to permit their wives to unveil. When I first visited Tashkent in 1928, a conference of communist women was announcing our members in backward villages are being violated, tortured and murdered. But this year we must finish the hideous veil. This must be the historic year. Shocking incidents gave point to this resolution. A girl from Tashkent school gave her vacation to agitating for women's rights in her home village. Her dismembered body was sent back to school in a cart bearing the words, that for your women's freedom. Another woman had refused the attentions of a landlord and married a communist peasant instead. A gang of 18 men, stirred up by the landlord, violated her in the eighth month of pregnancy and threw her body in the river. Poems were written by women to express their struggle. When Zulfia Khan, a free fighter for freedom, was burned alive by the mullahs, the woman of her village wrote a lament. O oh woman, the world will not forget your fight for freedom, your flame, let them not think that it consumed you. The flame in which you burned is a torch in our hands. The citadel of orthodox oppression was holy Bukhara. Here, a dramatic unveiling was organized. Word was spread that something spectacular would occur on International Women's Day, 8th of March. Mass meetings of women were held in many parts of the city on that day, and women speakers urged that everyone unveil all at once. Women then marched to the platform tossed their veils before the speakers and went to parade the streets. Tribunes had been set up where government leaders greeted the women. Other women joined the parade from their homes and tossed their veils to the tribunes. But that parade broke the veil tradition in holy Bukhara. Many women, of course, donned veils again before facing their angry husbands, but the veil from that time on appeared less and less. Soviet power used many weapons for the freeing of women. Education, propaganda, law, all had their place. Big public trials were held of husbands who murdered wives. The pressure of the new propaganda confirmed judges who gave the death sentence for what old custom had not considered a crime. The most important weapon for freeing women was, as in Russia proper, the new industrialization. I visited a new silk mill in Old Bukhara, its director, a pale, exhausted man driving without sleep to build a new industry, told me the mill was not expected to be profitable for a long time. We are training village women into a new staff for future silk mills of Turkestan. Our mill is the consciously applied force which broke the veiling of women. We demand that women unveil in the mill. Girl textile workers wrote songs of the new meaning of life when they exchanged the veil for the Russian headdress, the kerchief. And here's a little song that they wrote. When I took the road to the factory, I found there a new kerchief, a red kerchief, a silk kerchief, bought with my own hand's labor. The roar of the factory is in me. It gives me rhythm. It gives me energy. 
one can hardly read this without recalling, by contrast, Thomas Hood's The Song of the Shirt that expressed the early factories of Britain with fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread, stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger and dirt, and still with a voice of dolorous pitch, she sang the song of the shirt. In capitalist Britain, the factory appeared as a weapon of exploitation for profit. In the USSR, it was not only a means to collective wealth, but a tool consciously used to break past shackles. There you go. That's from a book called The Stalin Era by Anna Louise Strong. <laughs>